Okay, don't look now, but the Orange are on a winning streak. Two wins in a row against Power Conference competition. Things are looking up a little bit. Syracuse back to 500, 11 and 11 on the season after an 89-82 win over NC State. We're here to break it down on the Locked On Syracuse podcast. <laughs> Locked on Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in and thank you for making us your first listen every single weekday. Tim Leonard, Tyler Rocky here with you today. I guess you really can't call it a winning streak, but you know, it's back to back games. Multiple games. Multiple is a streak, Tim. Who's the, the hate way, on the show now, huh? The way this season has gone, it feels like, I mean, you tweeted out, it's been the first time since the Indiana FSU stretch yeah. that they've gone on a consecutive winning streak against Power 5 teams. They did have the Brown Cornell sort of post-COVID little stretch before the start of conference play. Also the first road win since Florida State on December 4th. And... What's interesting is Florida State sort of mirrored this game in a couple different ways. That first Florida State road win. One, Syracuse, sort of an iffy first half. Then they got it together in the second half. The Florida State first game around was much more defensive-minded. But the other thing that comes to mind is Cole Swider stepping up in the second half in that Florida State game. One of the few games that he stepped up sort of in the early to middle part of the season. Here we are, and we've crossed the midway point, I would say, by a little bit now. And Swider is starting to play, as Jim Beheim said, post game like the guy we envisioned. And he's an X factor for Syracuse. We've talked about it a lot. He goes out there, he leads the team in scoring along with words 19 points. Every starter scores between 19 and 19 points. You don't get any bench points in this game, which we will talk about. But a Swider, because this was, again, a huge performance from him, especially in the second half. You look at, I mean, the last two games, he's six for six from three. He is efficiency has gotten so much better. And was he due for a little bit of positive regression? Yeah. Like, he, he, don't get it wrong. Like, he is still a good shooter. He's shooting, what, about 36% from three, I believe, this season. So you look at the three games prior to Wake Forest one for five, one for six, one for seven. Those are his numbers from three. All right, those are going to take a turn for the better at a certain point. And what do you know? He's gone two for two, four for four the last two games now. Also put together eight rebounds in this one, too. He has found a different gear. And he was making tough shots, too. Like It wasn't like he was getting those open looks necessarily. He was hitting tough shots, guy in his face, in big moments, too. Like There were a couple down the stretch that he hit that were really important to – They weren't necessarily go-ahead buckets, but they brought the lead from one to four, two to five. Like Those are important buckets to get down the stretch to make the game a two-possession game and give yourself a little bit of leeway where, all right, now you just got to capitalize on some free throws down the stretch too. So I really liked what I saw. He did a really good job of of making some tough shots in this game. And again, that's kind of the Cole Swider we were promised when he came to Syracuse, when we saw some of those early exhibition matchups. And to see it come to fruition is nice, but you would have liked to see this a little bit earlier in the season. Yeah, no doubt. Last two games, you hit on it a little bit. 15 of 20 now from the floor. 18 against Wake, 19 in this game. He said something interesting on the little YouTube clip that Syracuse Athletics posted afterwards. I believe it was Mike Waters that sort of asked him, you look like you're playing with some more confidence. What's the difference? And he said, honestly, for me, the pressure is off at this point. Everyone has sort of written us off and I'm just embracing the, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but basically he's embracing the, everyone's written us off. We got nothing to worry about. Let's just go out there and play basketball mindset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's probably been making these shots in practice throughout the year. Like Joe Girard, we hear about that. It seems like they're better shooters. Gerard's been good shooting the basketball this year, but they're better shooters at times than we see in the games, more specifically with Cole. And you are right. Like he's shot it poorly throughout the year, but then you look down before this game and he's shooting like 35, 36% from three. It's not that terrible. It's just in this game, it felt like he did hit those big shots that sometimes he hasn't quite hit in certain moments. Florida state early in the year was one example of that too, but 
Syracuse never lost the lead in the second half once they got in this game, and they came really close to losing it a couple times, and a lot of those times, Cole Swider was there to hit a big shot. Like, I'm trying to remember what game it was. It may have even been the pick game, but there were times, and I think uh, the Wake Forest may have been one too, where he was missing those shots that he hit yeah. in this game. The ones that could bring the lead to four that could, or in the case of, I think it was the Wake Forest game, um, not the wind, but the loss on the road earlier this season. It, he had a couple chances where they were down two. He takes a three, a chance to give them the lead down one hits could have had a chance to get hit a three, give them the lead and miss those shots. This that's the difference between that Wake Forest game and, and this NC state game is Cole was hitting those shots. He was hitting the big shots guy in his face. Got to have it moments. And you, you bring up that interesting point that he said, and, you, you know, this team has one chance, really, in my book, to make the NCAA tournament. And that is by, I don't know if they necessarily have to win the ACC tournament, but you have to get to the ACC tournament championship game, all right, to at least put yourself in the conversation for things here. And those are going to be big-time pressure shots. So what happens when the pressure ramps back up? Is, is this team going to go back into its shell? Are they going to start playing like some of these road losses that we've seen this season against Pitt, against Wake Forest, Miami, where they kind of shell up and miss some of these big time shots when the lights are a little bit brighter, when the stakes are a little bit higher? Like, that's why I'm hesitant to, to dip back in because, all right, the pressure's off now. It, it can be easy to win when, when the pressure's off because you just go out there, play a little bit looser. But what happens when everything gets a little bit tighter in the body, when the stakes are raised a little bit? Because the, that time is going to come. It's going to come yeah. once we get to early March and things are going to mean a little bit more. Yeah, they're like a golfer that's backdoor top 10 right now. But can you do it when you're in the final group? You know, like yeah. sometimes. Rick, no wonder Ricky wears orange, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that only hit with a couple of people out there. But sometimes you'll see a guy on the PGA Tour cruise into the lead in the third round when the stakes are a little bit lower and he starts the day in 30th. And then all of a sudden you're in the final group and you find yourself in the thick of it. And it's a different story, but Syracuse isn't anywhere near the final group yet. We'll talk about it. This is sort of the start of a, a run here later on in the podcast. I do want to keep talking about Cole and just the way that this team played offensively, because it's interesting. It feels like Syracuse, the more aesthetically pleasing the game is, the better it is for Syracuse in a way. Yeah. And I'm not saying NC State's not physical, but they didn't really have a big that could bother Jesse or make it easy for Jesse to get into foul trouble. And that was a big key in this game as well, that Jesse had two fouls in the first half, only picked up one late in the second half, finishes the game with three personal fouls. That was important because he really started each half really strong and they made it a point. It seemed like to get him the ball early in each half. So I don't know. I feel like when it's up and down, it's a track meet like that. It's almost like probably how Syracuse's practices go. And that's when we see the good Joe Girard and the good Cole Swider, I'm assuming. Right. I mean, you saw some really good. Th I mean, Joe Girard, too. We need to shout him out. Eight assists to one turnover. I mean, this was a uh, someone tweeted us. This was New York Knicks, Joe, that we saw last <laughs> night. And you look at it, 18 points, three of six from three. Like, that's the frustrating part about this team. You see it's in them. There is the capability to put together these performances where they are hyper efficient and things are clicking like from a general standpoint, Joe didn't shoot the ball particularly great, but he shot the ball well from three. He made all mm -hmm. seven of his free throws and he set up his teammates. He had some nice passes to Jesse Edwards in this game um, that really got Jesse going in the second half that kind of revitalized him after he sat out a couple of minutes because of some foul trouble to close out the first half. And Jesse was an important piece to this offensive game because there was no answer for him on the NC state side. Like the only thing that sort of holds back Jesse and it's not just against NC state. It's against almost every team. The only thing that's standing in Jesse Edwards way is Jesse Edwards. And that what I mean by that is the fouls. Yeah. And in this game, you saw him limited in that first half because he had the foul trouble. Then he comes in in the second half, largely stays out of it. And he ends up with 19 points, super efficient, shooting the basketball, eight of nine. And I tweeted this out too. He didn't set his season high in rebounds, but this was his most impressive rebounding game because he went up and got some physical boards over guys that I don't think he would have gotten two games ago, three games ago, five games ago. 
he went up and got some really tough rebounds in this game as well. And then that can't go by the wayside. That's part of the development, being strong with the basketball. And also, he got some blocks in this game. He had the three blocks, and he's been blocking shots all season long, but he got blocks, and it was in situations where he normally fouls, and he turns them into clean blocks. This was one of his best games of the season. And and a certain, and he's had a lot of really good games this season, but I think yeah. this was sort of a stepping stone game almost for him too. He stayed out of foul trouble. He was a strong rebounder, hyper-efficient uh, scoring the basketball as well. And then he, he got three blocks in this game. You can't ask for a lot more than that. Yeah, he was really good in this game for sure. The bench, not so great, and they didn't play hardly any minutes. They did not score a single point, so... We'll discuss whether that is a concern for Syracuse, the fact that they scored 89 points but did not have any points off their bench. First, I want to tell you about Bet Online because they have you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football continues its march to the playoffs right to the big game in a couple weeks, BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just football. Bet Online has up to the minute info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, along with live real time updates on current games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. Bet Online, where the game starts. So the bench has zero points in this game. It's funny, I was watching that North Carolina Louisville game that went to overtime, it was a total mm-hmm. ref show on Tuesday <laughs> night. And. UNC ekes it out at kick. I don't even know if you call it eke it out. They just got the game kind of handed to them by the refs. Went at 90 to 83. They scored 90 in that game in overtime. They didn't have a single bench point. And Louisville had 44 bench points, which is an abnormally large number. But I don't know. It's kind of a tough question to answer. Are we concerned about the zero bench points? Because on one hand, I don't really blame Jim Beheim for not playing the bench a ton in this game when the starters are clicking. I don't really yeah. get the Jimmy at the five thing, and that's a whole nother topic. But it's tough because I think we both want Benny to play, but we also both are some of the first people to admit that Benny is not playing well when he's out there, and right. we're not coming at it from moments a- with him. Yeah, like we're not coming at it from a standpoint of Syracuse will be a lot better if Benny plays more than Jimmy Beheim, But, and and I don't think Jim Beheim's ever going to say, you know, this is a lost season. We're just going to play Benny. He's never going to give up on the season. He's not no. like that. So it's hard for me to really nitpick too much of the bench when we score 89 points and we win the game. But it is disappointing that we're still not getting anything scoring wise from the bench. Well, the bench also only took one shot, too. Yeah. So it's tough to score when you don't shoot the basketball as well. And I get it from that standpoint. I'll say this. I didn't think the bench played great in this game either to warrant. Like, you look at Samir. He was out there 11 minutes, two turnovers. Like, when Joe's Joe was played, good. So right, why, exactly. You know. Exactly. And this is what we always talk about. It's always situational with their minute split. There are going to be games where you – Feel like okay, Samir should play upwards of twenty minutes, and J- while Joe plays twenty five to thirty, there's also going to be games like this one where it warrants Joe playing. I mean, if you look at it, and he had three fouls in this game too, but I would say the thirty two minutes for Joe maybe a little light too for, <laughs> yeah. for how well he played in this game. Um, so there, there again, it's a situational thing. It's and it's Joe dependent too. And you could say, oh, well, isn't it matchup dependent? Well, no, Joe kind of dictates that because there have been games where he's gone up against tight defenses and played well. There's also been games where he's gone up against pedestrian defenses and played poorly, too. So it's all Joe dependent on what the minute split should be. And then in the case of Frank Anselm, he picks up three fouls in four minutes. Like, it's tough to play a guy like that. And you also tweeted out during this game, like, if we're not seeing Brahma Sidibe in this game, right. like, we're not seeing him this year. Because this was the perfect opportunity. We've talked about it a couple of times to have him come in and absorb a couple of fouls at a minimum. All right. Like if he can't give you those final 70 seconds of the first half when you've got Frank with three and Jesse with two fouls, like what are we doing? What, what are you doing out there? Yeah. I wonder, is he healthy? Is he going through? I mean, I just don't Does know. Does he want to play? Like, what? Does he want to play? That's another well, thing, too. He, he probably does want to play. I mean, it's hard to say. We don't know. But I just wonder, 
does he go through a, you know, the knee felt worse today than the knee was yesterday type of stuff. And maybe that's part of it because he has been out there for times and he's even played in moments where we didn't really need him. Like we could have gone to Frank Anselm before him. Yeah. And then in this scenario, you know, I'm probably okay with just keeping Frank back there and letting him rack up four or five fouls because I guess that's tough though, because Jesse is so quick to get into foul trouble. So then you really could screw yourself. Yeah. And there's a lot Jesse, you're putting too much pressure on Jesse. We talk about it too. Like Jesse's not a first half foul trouble person. Maybe yeah. gets two. If he gets a second, it comes late. Usually he usually gets one in the first half. And then it's the second half where teams start to attack him, and then boom, boom, boom. It feels like he picks up his third and fourth in rapid succession. Yeah, well, in this first step, he did not play a ton in the first half because he started out the game great, and I thought it was going to be a big game. And shout out to you, by the way, for picking him in the prop shop to be the leading scorer. Thank you. He just hit that. I got my Jesse game. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good call because it's a matchup where NC State doesn't have Manny Bates. They were also down their other starting center, and this guy Gibson, who did have kind of a career game, was forced to play there, but they don't really have a big that can handle him. And it's weird that we're on the reverse end of that for once as Syracuse. But, you know, Frank plays four minutes in the first half. Jimmy played some at the five. So I don't have the exact minute split in front of me. Jesse plays 31 in this game, according to Ken Palm. ESPN has it as 26 minutes. So somewhere in that range, he didn't play that much in the first half overall, though, compared to normal. And Jim Beheim maybe was just cognizant of the fact that he already had picked up one foul early, then he picked up the second foul, and he's like, you know what? We're not going to get you to three fouls in the first half. That puts you us couldn't in a afford to. territory. I mean, and remember the game flow of the first half. It was an NC State half. Like, yeah. Syracuse turned it on in the second. So the game flow suggested you can't do that. You can't risk getting Jesse into foul trouble because you're going to need him in the second half, and without him in that second half, they don't win this game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because he, he played like a man possessed in that second half with getting some boards. He got a couple of timely blocks and getting some big buckets too for this team. I mean, he, he got him and Joe, there's some sort of connection there where it's like a quarterback and his favorite receiver. I mean, yeah. they, there's one player that I think Joe does a really good job of moving the ball to, and it is Jesse Edwards. I don't know why it's not a, a full five man uh, sort of comfort level for Joe Girard. But the Joe Girard to Jesse Edwards stuff has been there pretty much all season long. Right. And Buddy had yeah, a really I felt nice like, pass to him, too. Yeah, he did. Yeah. It, Joe was really good in this game. And I felt like in the first half, Syracuse was down by three at the end of the first half. But I weirdly felt more confident that they were going to win the game at the end of the first half than I did at the start of the game. Because NC State was 10 for 20 from three. And that just felt a little bit unsustainable. Yeah. Like, everything kind of went right for NC State in the first half. And they only had a three point lead and they're at home and all that stuff. And then I was just worried that they were going to give up the lead in the second half, because if you give up the lead on the road in conference and it's late in the game, you might not get it back, but they didn't give up the lead because Cole and some, and even Jimmy hit a big three at one point, everyone kind of stepped up. So I did not have a problem necessarily with this specific game in terms of the rotation for Jim Beheim. It's just tough to see Benny Williams only playing five minutes, knowing that he is a priority for the rest of the season. But I just don't think Jim Beheim is ever going to sit there and, and have the conversation. This season's lost, and I'm going to change my coaching style because of that. He's never going to admit that. Right. And the beautiful thing about college basketball, too, is you can be down on your luck all regular season long, right? All it takes is five good games in in the conference tournament and yeah. your, your entire luck has switched. You find yourself, I mean, ask Georgetown last year, right? I mean, that, that's what they did. Oregon state happened with them too. So there's two of the power six conferences where there was a bid stealer last year. And I'm not saying that Syracuse is going to go out and win the ACC tournament, but the season technically is not over until you play your final ACC tournament game. So it's it's tough from that regard, too, because it, there is still a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel because there is that great factor at the end. Now, am I picking it? Hell no, I'm not picking it. I, I've seen this team all season long. At the end of the day, they're a 500 team right now. It's February 3rd. Yeah, like, right. you're still sub 500 in the ACC, but uh, you also have to know that this team may be rallying everything that it's got for that stretch at the end of 
at the or at the beginning of March when the games actually mean the most, really. And who knows what it's going to be like? Because we kind of talked about with Cole earlier how the pressure is off now of these guys because these everyone's sort of written them off. The stakes aren't as high, really, for the rest of the regular season because right. I don't know if there's a regular season path to getting into the NCAA tournament or getting yourself into the conversation for the NCAA tournament. But when the pressure ramps back up, are you going to be able to put together this performance where you score 89 points? I don't know. I don't see yeah. it happening. Well, let's get into that conversation a little bit. Is this a start potentially of a run for Syracuse? We'll do that in just a second. But in, there is an incredible new app that everyone who buys gas needs to know about. It's called Get Upside. My listeners are earning cash back for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code SCORE for $0.25 cents per gallon or more on your first fill-up cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using GetUpside. Just download the app for free. Use promo code SCORE for $0.25 cents per gallon or more on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to $300 a year in cash back, and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your account. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code SCORE to get $0.25 cents per gallon or more cash back on your first tank. That's code SCORE at GetUpside. Continuing with kind of that golfer analogy that we were bringing up earlier, it feels like Syracuse right now is is in, what, like 45th, 50th place in the tournament. If the tournament yeah. is you know, actually being in the thick of the NCAA tournament race. I think they could go on a run here to get to. But we've been telling you that. Like, yeah, we've always felt that way. And you it, look at, we, what do we, where do we start the landmark here? Back at the pit game, the pit win that this team had, we said, listen, you got 12 games in front of you. There are 10 extremely winnable games. Yeah. And you go 10 and two, you're going to need a 10 and two. Well, guess what? We're six games in and you're already three and three. Yeah, and I think, actually, I thought the run, maybe, if anything, would have come a little bit earlier. I thought after they lost to Wake in overtime on the road, that was three straight losses early January, they had Pitt, then they had Florida State at home, which they lost, Clemson at home. I thought they were going to win three in a row before Duke, and and then maybe even they should have beat Pitt on the road, and this would be three mm -hmm. in a row right now. So wins are out there but I feel like they're probably going to go on a run. My problem is they're in 50th place in the golf tournament right now. In other years when they've gone on a run, they've been in 25th, 30th place. And then that's gotten them into the NCAA tournament conversation. This is going to get them to a nice backdoor top 25, a nice payday for some, yeah. but it's not going to win you the tournament or get you in the NCAA tournament. They have to really turn on the afterburners. Could they do it? Yeah, but it's just what does it mean? It's so hard to see. Yeah, right now exactly. 11 and 11. Right. So you look at the next five games you got here, right? Home against Louisville, a Louisville team that is reeling right yeah. now. I mean, you think things are bad at Syracuse. See what's going on at Louisville. Then you've got BC on the road. You've got a road game against Virginia Tech. Not going to be easy. And then back to back home games against BC and Georgia Tech. So four of your next five games, you're looking at Ken Palm 122 or worse. Four of the next five. So yeah. Those should be four wins over your next five. Then you get into a really tough stretch to close out the year at Notre Dame, who's the most underrated team in the ACC right now, at Duke, at Carolina, who's playing better, home against Miami. Duke's at been, home, but yeah. Uh, oh, no, yeah, you're it. right. Duke's yeah. at home. Duke's at home. Um, and not to mention, that stretch from February 19th to February 28th, you're looking at five games in 10 days. Yeah. It's not easy. You're, you're going to be living like an NBA team for that 10-day stretch. And you've got three games in a week, one time in there. You're going home, away, home, away. So a lot of travels packed in there as well. Like that is going to be a brutal stretch for this team. And we kind of called it when it, it got announced this way. Like th this feel like they caught the shaft on, on <laughs> this little stretch that, that they're coming up on uh, because of the Georgia Tech rescheduling to that Monday. And it's shuffling around the, the Notre Dame game as well. But Listen, this end of season stretch is not going to be easy. It is not. And that's the thing that you're kind of holding out hope for is you're going to need some of these marquee wins banked up, whether it's Duke, 
Carolina, you're going to need one of those games and it's going to be coming at the back end of the most brutal stretch. These guys have probably played in, in their college careers. Right. And it's end of the season and you, and you don't use your bench much. In fact, you use it the fewest amount of any team in the country. So that doesn't help matters when you're playing a lot of games in a short amount of time. If it's Florida state, it's a different story. Like Florida state earlier this year, just added a game on a Thursday against North Florida, because why not? And, and yeah. Syracuse can't really have that luxury with only playing seven, eight guys. And really, even though they do, now you're going to get a week, you get pretty much a week, but between Virginia tech on the road and then the start of this five and 10, but yes, yeah. How much is that week going to help you out when you get to the February 26th game at against Duke in the dome? Like how much is that week actually going to help you out? Yeah. Those last four games are literally the top four teams in the conference standings yep. right now. Notre Dame, Duke, UNC, Miami. Right now, Duke is eight and two. They have a half game lead for first place in the ACC. Notre Dame, UNC, Miami, all tied for second, eight and three in the conference. So, it's as tough as it gets, and a couple of those are on the road. Miami and Duke are at home. You do have to play Virginia Tech on the road. Virginia Tech's kind of rounding into form here, and they're, they've they got a lot to play for because they're closer to the bubble than you are right now, although I saw someone, I think it was ESPN, posted sort of a graphic, and they had a funny phrase of under consideration for yeah. Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. That's Everyone's under now. consideration, but yeah. they couldn't quite say they were on the bubble yet. I think they're Louisville's a big game because as much as Louisville is 122 in Ken Palm and Ken Palm has Syracuse favored by seven at home right now, I still think Louisville could win that game. Yeah. The key that we're going to discuss on tomorrow's podcast is Malik Williams. I know he was suspended for the last game against UNC. He to me is just a kryptonite waiting to happen for Syracuse in terms of the presence he is as a big guy. If he's in the game, it changes my opinion. But if he's not playing, that's a game you should win. And there's a lot of games you should win in the near future here. And all of a sudden, you could be looking up and saying, all right, we're 15 and 12, 16. And like, it's feasible at that point that mm -hmm. you're getting into the territory where you've been before and somehow made the tournament from there. It's still just asking a lot. And then you have that really tough stretch. We've got nine games left here. All right. To close out the season. You got to go six and three at least, probably seven and two. Now that I think about it a little bit deeper, and you got to win two of the final four. You got to win two of Notre Dame, Duke, Carolina, and Miami. And I think one of them has to be against one of the boys on Tobacco Road, too. Yeah. One of the Duke or Carolina games. Got to win one of them. That Carolina game's on the road. Duke's game, Duke game's at home. One of those has to be a win if, you're, if you want to start talking about it. Otherwise, it's, it's ACC tournament or bust. Right. Put it this way. Jim Beheim, seven wins away right now from getting to a thousand for the second time. I think you got to hit that in the regular season. Like you said, you got to win seven yep. of your last nine. Maybe if you go six and three, you're definitely in the conversation, depending on where your wins fall and where your losses fall. But it's not so much just the record this year because the ACC is down and also Syracuse has losses that they just haven't had before. When you talk about giving up 100 to Colgate, when you talk about Georgetown, who has not won a Big East game, Georgetown's 6-13 and 13 or something this year, they stink. Yeah, We lost to them. And that's just your second road win, really, of the entire season. I, I guess you could say Arizona State at a neutral site, but Arizona State's 134 in Ken Palm. So outside of Indiana, you haven't necessarily beat a tournament team at this stage of the season and a uh, wake forest maybe will be, mm -hmm. I mean, they're a nine seed right now, but still Florida it's, state it's, could be. Yeah. Yeah. But Florida state even has dropped three in a row. They're, they're 84 in yeah. Kemp pumps. They're now, behind they're, they're one game better than, than Syracuse in the ACC right now. Right. One game better. Yeah. Five and six in the ACC. If you had told me that at the start of the year, I would have thought we were in the bubble conversation, but the ACC has been even worse than even I thought. And I was pretty down on the conference going into the year. So, all right, well, next game is Louisville and that is on Saturday, 2 PM tip tomorrow's podcast. We'll dive into anything that comes up recruiting wise or football wise or anything like that. We'll also get you guys ready for Louisville, do our prop shop, hopefully hear from Anthony DeBundo, get his, digit report on the game that's a big game inside the dome one of your 
few home games really in this stretch here. So need to get that win against Louisville on Saturday. We'll get you guys ready for it on the show tomorrow. Until then, thanks for listening today.